pretty full on, isn't it? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we all come here to, today to you to hear your word. You don't randomly put these stories in the word. But as the Apostle Paul have said, you've left them there to teach us. Spirit of God, teach us today, we pray. May I be just an instrument and a vessel for you to speak. I pray that you speak a now rhema word, a word that brings healing, a word that brings deliverance, a word that brings freedom. You have your way in this place. Let us learn the lessons that we can take out of this story. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. It's pretty full on. My message today is faulty signal. If you're taking notes, faulty signal. Amnon uh, was David's uh, son, and he was actually the firstborn son of David. And, and David had multiple children, and, and, and in accordance to the law of the time, he was the next in throne because he was the oldest son. Uh, Amnon had this sister. The Bible says she was a beautiful sister named Tamar, uh, but she was half, his half-sister. She wasn't uh, full the same. She didn't come from the same father or mother, but he had her from two different women uh, in his life. What I want to start off by exploring in this story is that clearly that Amnon had a problem. He was battling in his sexuality. He was battling with desires that he knew were forbidden. And, and, and he, he, he needed help in that particular moment. I, I propose to all, everyone in this room that Amnon was not in love, but he was in lust. Because love speaks a very language, a very different language to what is happening in this particular story. And he's battling with this lust in his life. And, 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 and what lust is, the Christianity Today website defines lust as this. A strong craving or desire often a, of a sexual nature. John Piper, one of the great Bible teachers of our time, he defines lust as a sexual desire that dishonors its object and disregards God. The dictionary says that lust is an intense or unrestrained sexual craving. The focus of lust is pleasing oneself without regard for the consequences or for others that are involved. And that is the base definition of lust, but what he was battling was these lustful desires that he was trying to be in conflict and fight against, and he kept it all to himself. And Amnon was, he, he, he battled this so much that he became evident externally. The Bible says he became to the point he became ill. He became sick. Now, I, I have told you how in my teenage years, I thought I was in love. I was actually in lust because I couldn't stop thinking about this girl that I never saw, but I was talking on the phone about. And what I really, I thought it was love, like tingly feelings in my heart, like there was butterflies that I feel light, I feel dizzy sometimes when I'm talking to her. And, 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 and I promise you, we used, I used to listen to country songs. I never told any of my boys because we listen to R&B, but I'm listening to, blah, 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 you know, these country songs that I never would listen to, but she was into it. And I'm like, I love this girl. I love this girl. But I wasn't in love, I was in lust. I wanted some things for her, but I never cared about her specifically. But he was obsessed, and in his obsession, he became sick. He knew he couldn't have her. That's something that Amnon knew. He knew that legally he couldn't have her. According to God's truth and God's word, he couldn't have it. It will not be a possible situation for him to have his half-sister sexually. It was forbidden. Amnon battling with his sexuality, fighting urges within him, he needed help with this. He was at a stage in his life where he is, without knowing, he's crying out for help and there's desires that he's in conf conflict with. And, and I want to speak to those of you today that, are, that might be battling with your sexuality. I'm going to talk about things that perhaps you've never heard a message on, but I know that it needs to be talked about because that's where healing comes. Healing comes when there's teaching, when there's the Word of God, when there's truth, when there's light that is shed on it. I want to speak, if you are in this room and you're 
desires, your conflicts inside, your lustful desires, you don't understand it. Some of you might be homosexual desires. Now, I don't want people laughing and giggling. When I teach that in the youth, they might be. But I know as adults, we're mature to handle these things. But I fully am aware that in the church of God, this exists. You might be a Christian and you're scared to share anyone these desires, but you're conflicted on the inside and there's homosexual desires that are on the inside of you. Some of you might be battling with desires that are pedophilia. You see, we don't talk about these things, but, but they exist because people that do these things, they don't just wake up one day and say, oh, it was a build up of things that were never addressed, things that were in the dark. And because they were in the dark, the light never sh was shining upon it. But I want to speak, if you're in this room and like Amnon, you're conflicted with desires that you know are forbidden. It is important that you recognize that the desire is there. And that those desires are wrong. That's what Amnon failed to realize. That his desires, God forbid it. And that his desires are something that needed to be helped with. But Amnon overlooked all those things in the midst of this battle, battle that he had with a desire for his half-sister. What Amnon needed in this battle was someone to help him and not enable his toxic Lust. He needed someone to come alongside him and say, Amnon, this is not you. You can come out of this. That's the person that Amnon needed in this stage of his life. But we see that Amnon, he gets this help from someone that should have been the closest to him, which was his cousin. His cousin is his friend. So the Bible is saying that his cousin was his friend. It shows us that they grew up together, that they had a relationship, and it wasn't a random occurrence. It was someone that he trusted. And Jonadab was, was the Bible says, a crafty cousin named Jonadab. The last time I read that in the Bible, it speaks in Genesis of someone named the serpent, the devil himself. We have to be careful of people that are in our lives that we share our struggles to that don't have the best interest for us. We have to be careful who we let the deepest secrets of our hearts, who we, let, uh, who we share those struggles with. Jonadab asked him, tell me, man, I see you're always down and you always look miserable. You're always, you know, you're not, you're not you anymore. What's happening? Tell me. It seems like it was a caring thing that his cousin was doing. And when Amnon finally discloses the reason why he has been acting the way he has, instead of discouraging, instead of correcting and rebuking and helping him, what he does is he encourages the behavior rather than rebuke it. The Bible says that Jonadab was a crafty person. He was a devil. A devil. He had the nature of a devil. We have to be careful of close people that are around us that are devils. Now, you might not hear this, but this is exactly what was happening here. He was sneaky and crafty, and he set him up. He was battling with this, and he set him up, not for him to succeed and come out of this, but he set him up for what would ultimately lead to his death. In Romans 6, 13, the Bible says this, Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God, for you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body, your whole body, as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Did you know, young person, that your body is an instrument for God to use? Do you know what we pray, my wife and I on Zoe, we lay our hands and we say, may you become an instrument of righteousness and not of wickedness. We pray that over her again and again because we are, are, are instruments that is used by God. So the life that can change the world around us is just a vessel that God is speaking to. You have to understand a spiritual principle that God has given this world to man and God uses man to reach the people of this world. In the same way, demonic beings, demonic spirits, they need a body to manifest the desires that they have. So without a body, without an instrument, they cannot operate the things that they want to do upon this earth. 
So just as God uses our bodies as instruments to carry out his will, demons also need bodies to carry out their desires. There are those that are instruments of evil and we must be careful of the advice that we get and receive in our life. These are the people that come around you and they seem to care about you. They seem to have the best interest for you, but they are carefully, strategically calculating your downfall and your ruin. These are the people that might say, you are my best friend, BFF, best friends forever. They might get you a necklace. They might get you a matching bracelet. These are the people that you need to be careful with. They really want to get close to you, not to help you, but to kill you. Jonadab, if he really loved his cousin, should have rebuked the wicked lustful desires. One of the characteristics of love that I'm going to go to a, a little bit later is that it rejoices when the truth wins out. Jonadab didn't love his cousin. He was strategically close to him to plot his downfall. People who love you will not say, go ahead. It's your life. Do whatever you want. Forget about what they say. This is your life, man. Go for it. Do whatever you want. Own the moment. Be the woman that you were, you know, be, be. You know, that's not what people that love you will do. When you're, da- when you're battling with toxic desires that you know, that you need help with, be careful of people that come and enable that toxic de- desire that is within us. People that love us will tell you the truth no matter how painful it is for you to hear because it is the truth that ultimately sets us free. It was the advice of Jonadab that made him act out his lust and that ultimately got him killed. Now, one of the things that we need to know is that when we are battling with sin, when we're battling with desires that are that are that are that are of the you know, it's the Bible says that we are all have that nature, that sinful nature. The the heart is deceitful above all things and wicked. We are all capable, I am capable of anything. I fully am aware of that. I am not in any way prone to all these things. I am capable of anything. I know that. That's why I rely, I depend, I lean on my Jesus. I know that apart from him, without from him, I can do nothing. And and one of the things that the Bible tells us, the creator that created our bodies, that knows how body functions best, he created our emotions, he created all of these things, anger, all of these things, God created us. And he gave us healthy ways to use them and, and he gave us ways that we use our bodies in a negative way, our emotions in a negative way. But one of the things that James says is to confess our sins to one another. So perhaps this dark secret, this dark thing that he's been going through on the inside, it was good that he let it out, but it is the problem was who he let that secret out to. So the confession is good, but who are we confessing to? Because the Bible says what brings healing in our life is us letting these secrets out. Confession is important. But be careful of the people that you spill out your secrets to. Let me, let me just inject something here. If you're in a relationship and you just started talking to the guy one week ago, don't talk about things that you're, 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 you're struggling with, that, that you've been through in your life in the very first week without knowing anything about that particular person. You have to be careful. Guard your heart. Guard your heart. Take things slow. And I know that in the, on the phone, they might push you, oh, tell me about you, who you are. You don't have to disclose everything. You can choose what you want to disclose, especially things like this, because you never know, you never know what people will do with that. Second thing that I want to highlight, apart from the advice and the struggle that he had, I want to touch on the rape and the sexual abuse that we see in this particular story. So what Amnon does is he takes the advice and carries out the plan. He pretends he's sick, and when his father David visits him, he says, Father, I just have one request. Send Tamar, my sister, because women, the, the women, especially the daughters of the king, they were protected. They were not allowed to be alone with any man, even if it's family. But he had this request because he was sick. His dad loved his son, so he wanted to grant his request. And he said, I just have one request. And he requested what Jonadab advised him. 
So Tamar goes innocently, not knowing anything that is before her. She's doing this at the kindness of her heart. She wants to help her brother that is ill or that is pretending to be ill. So David, uh, David trusts his son. He's saying, you know what? He's perhaps thinking, he's my son. She's my daughter. I mean, things will be okay. I trust my son. I trust my daughter. And he never probably crossed this thing, never probably crossed in his mind. I want to raise a couple of very tough points here, and, 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 and that is got to do especially with sexual abuse. David trusted Amnon with Tamar because he was her brother. I don't think that David comprehended that evil act will be done by someone so close. Let me share with you a story, and then I'll, I'll share with you what I want to say about that. We went to a particular, I went to a particular place, I was invited, and, and in that church, they, had a, they wanted to have a woman's gathering. This is the older woman. And they got them, and there was heaps of them, there was probably 30 of them, and, and they sat in a circle, and, and, and I was supposed to share with them uh, something, whatever is in my heart, uh, for that particular group of ladies. What the Lord was putting in my heart is, is share with them about uh, sexual abuse, especially as when they were kids, because I've, I know that this is an area that in our, in our culture, I don't know about other cultures, but in our culture, it is a taboo. It is something that is never spoken about. And, and, and what I, I just obeyed God in that moment. And I said, this is very tough. You, it might be hard for you to take this, but I'm going to raise this because I know that you're suffering in silence. And I know that God can bring a healing in this very moment. And I talked about the subject and the room was dead silent. No one was talking, but I kept talking. And I said, I'm not expecting anyone to say anything in this moment but I want to say that if you're I know that some of you might be struggled with this in the past when your children you might have been abused by someone that is close in your life but I'm telling you that God can bring healing even in situations like that and I just encourage the ladies why don't you gather together in an environment like this and in a safe place why don't you begin to discuss these things and I never expected what happened next I never thought it would happen but as I'm talking, one of the ladies in the back, she slowly, reluctantly puts her hand up. She's a mom and she has kids. She has a couple of kids. And then she, began, she begins to weep and cry and she begins to share her story to all the ladies that were there. And she begins to share of how that happened by her uncle when she was a child. And she said, it has been something that I battled with all my life. And it's something that I never talked about. And it's something that I've punished all of the people that love me around me because I never dealt with it. And I did, began to deal with it in a toxic way. And I was blown away. I was shocked that, that I've never seen this in among the, old, the older people, the older, uh, the older generation. And she began to do that. And then all of a sudden, another hand began to go up. And it was her, her sister. And her sister began to say, that happened not just to her, but to me as well. And there was such an emotion in the room. And I can see that there were many others that wanted to say me too. But then... But then you know, just stop there. And then there's one more other person I think that, that also said, I've experienced something like that. But do you know what we learn in this? David never would have predicted that by such a close family member that something like this would happen. And do you know when I did the, the research on this, most of the time sexual abuse doesn't happen from people that are from a distant land. It happens from close friends. It happens from close family. It happens from trusted people that have already have a relationship with, with the family. We've been hearing recently in the Catholic Church and the reports that have been coming out, there's been many, many incidents and, and reports of that. And it's been hidden. It's been kept secret. But I want to give you the keys for you to live in freedom. I want to speak to those of you. I battled with this. I said, God, this is heavy. How am I going to share? He said, tell them because I want my children to be free. I want to speak to those of you who have battled, who have encountered sexual abuse, especially as a child. You might have never shared this with anyone. 
but it's something that you've kept and it's something that has walked with you all the days of your life and you have not been able to move forward from it, I want to help you to give you tools in your hands. I remember once a certain person gave me a call from the adults and he said, I met this girl on the, on the Uber uh, taxi that I was driving. And he said, she's, she seems like she's been through a lot, but I didn't have sufficient English to explain the gospel. Can you call her? I called her and we began to talk. And you, you have no idea who she is, so it's safe for me to say this. I'm very careful about things that I share, only if when I get permission and when I know that you have no possible reason, I mean, possible way of finding out. But this woman, I began to talk to her and she began to share with me her story. And she was very angry. She said, you're a pastor. I said, yeah. She said, well, tell me, you know so much about God. And she, she was very angry. And I said, I mean, I don't know everything, but whatever I can help, I'll try and help you. And she began to open up and share with me her story. And she said, when I was young, she said, my mom and dad, as a small child, they gave me up for adoption. And she said, why did your God make them do that? And I sat there. I, I'm like, how do I respond to this? And, and I just said, just it's like in spontaneous in the moment. I believe God was just directing me. I said, I'm sorry, her name I called. I said, God didn't make them do it. They chose to give you away. She said, how dare you say that? It was God that made them do it. This, I said, I called her name again. God didn't do it. God didn't do it. He gave them free will and they chose to give you away. Because she talked about how hell, the hell she's been through because of the, the decision that God made them to give her away to the foster system and what she's been through in that. And she had cancer when I was speaking to her. She had cancer that she's been battling with and she's dating uh, some, a, a man that is, that is Muslim and she just had a twisted understanding of God and because she, she knows about Christianity. I think she grew up uh, hearing about the Christian faith and she said, is God punishing me with cancer because I'm dating a Muslim man? And I said, God is not doing that. I said, God is not the author of evil. I kid you not, without exaggeration, 30 minutes of me repeating, God did not give you away. Your parents gave you away. I just keep repeating the same thing. You, you can't say it. half an hour. Half an hour. I looked at my wife, half an hour. And then after half an hour, she just, it's like a light bulb went on. She, she's swearing. She's like, oh my effing God. She said, oh my God. God didn't do it. My mom and dad had a will and they chose to do what they did to me. It wasn't God. And all my life I've been blaming God and I've been, I've been angry at him and I've been running away from him when, when, because I thought that he made them give me away. And you see, the pain of her story was when she finally discovered her parents, she found out that they both committed suicide. And she's saying, why is my life the way that it is? And I said, I cannot answer you that. But one thing that I can answer you, I can answer you with confidence is that God didn't make anyone do anything. That God gave us this thing called free will. And unfortunately, love is out of the free will. It's not something that you can force someone. He gave us free will. And she said, for the first time in my life, I've understood that it wasn't God, but it was my parents. And I said, can I pray for you? And we began to pray. I promise you, I, I've, one of the, the moments that I strongly sensed the, the power of the Holy Spirit outside on the grass lawn of my house. I sensed the Spirit of God wherever she was bringing healing in her heart. And she's crying uncontrollably. She's just crying. She's saying, what's happening? I'm like, God is healing you and God is setting you free. And I know that God changed her life from that particular moment. But why do bad things happen to good people? Tamar didn't wake up that morning expecting to go through what she went through. And a lot of the time, what the enemy whispers in our ears is that God is the author of the evil that comes in our life. But one thing that I want to live with you, friends, is that whatever things that we've experienced in our life, God is not the author of the evil. God gave free will to man and men and women are willingly evil. And in this particular moment, she goes innocently into the room to look after her sick brother. And he gets 
everyone out of the room so there are no witnesses. And he demands to sleep with her. He said, sleep with me, my darling sister. He, 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 he somehow, he has made his mind believe that what he's doing is justified. He begs, she begs him and she pleads with him, don't do such a wicked thing. And as the story goes, he overpowers her and he rapes her. I know that it's not talking about childhood abuse here, but what I've seen in my short time of counseling is that I've seen men and women that have been through sexual abuse when they were young. And it's often happened to those that are close in the family, to relatives. And what I want to tell you, your story does not end when that thing has happened to you. There is hope for you. There is another better day. I promise you that this gospel is so powerful that it can help you to move forward from the tragedy that has occurred in your life. The Bible says that Amnon said, I'm in love with my sister Tamar. But we can see in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4 to 7, what love is. And we can contrast and compare. Was Amnon really in love? Was he in lust? The Bible says that love is patient. That word patient is long-suffering. Love is kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable. It keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith. It always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. Love is patient was the first thing that the Bible mentions what love is. You know, a lot of the relationships, even that we're in, a side note here, we can, we can determine, am I really loving this person by measuring the definition of love that we have to the definition of love the Bible gives us? Because the people that we are with, when we truly love them, this is the type of love that God says that we have towards one another. Amnon couldn't wait to do what he lusted for. He wasn't patient at all. He grabbed her. And even though she told him to wait and ask her father, he couldn't wait to act out the gratification that was building up in his life. The, way, the word patient here actually means long-suffering. That means endures long. This is what that, the idea behind it. God, God's love is long-suffering means he's patient with us when, we, when he should have given up on us. You know when we're in relationships and we're saying, let's just say you're not married because to married people this is irrelevant. But if you're dating or if you're engaged and you're saying that I love this person and, and, and you don't put up with the things that, you know, just yesterday I'll be transparent. I'll talk about it in the marriage. But I drove to Williamstown Beach at 11.30 p.m. Uh, because I had an argument with my wife. Um, and, and, and I was... I was, I was upset, and, and I said, you know what, I'm going to go for a drive, and, and I went, I like going to the beach, because when I go to the beach, it just clears my mind, I saw the waves, but one mistake that I did, was when I was rushing out of the house, I didn't grab a jacket, and I was, gra and I was wearing a shirt that is like, because my stomach is a bit out, uh, it, it stretches, and then wind comes in easily. <laughs> My daughter bagged me in the, in the funniest way this week. She said, I was lying down on the bed. She came and hugged my stomach. And she said, Daddy, your tummy is so fluffy and cuddly. <laughs> and I said, oh my goodness, this girl is killing me. And then she said, it's so cushiony, Dad. <laughs> and then my wife was sleeping next to me. And then she lied on her. And she's like, Mommy, yours is like a teddy bear. But Daddy's is more comfortable. <laughs> Anyways, let me keep going. Uh, I went, I went, uh, where was I? Why am I sharing that story? Uh, and I went out and, and I was just thinking and, and, then, and then I was listening to worship music. I've learned, I've learned that when I'm angry, that when I'm upset, I don't throw a tantrum, go to the bar and drink 
alcohol and then say, I've had enough of life. I've learned. I've learned. I don't run away from God. I run to him. I've learned that. God has taught me. It took time, but he's taught me. And I went to God and I'm like, I'm just going to walk. And I put worship song and I'm walking. And then I'm sitting down just thinking, clarifying my mind. I'm like, why am I, why did I react that way? I'm assessing my own emotions. And then my phone goes, ding. I knew that was a message, and I looked at it. It says wifey, and with iPhone, you need to look at it to unlock. I'm like, should I read it? Am I in the mood? I said, I'm going to read it. And, and she, she, she sent me this lovely message saying, I love you, baby. I'm sorry for the way I spoke to you. This, I'll share with you in marriage uh, the message, actually. It was very beautiful. And then I had, a, I had a choice right there. Do I continue to be angry, or do I forgive, and do I say, I'm sorry for my part in this, and move forward? And, and I chose the latter. And I, and I went back home, and I, and I said, hi, baby, and, and we continued, and, and then, as marriage, life goes. Um, <laughs> oh, no, nothing happened. <laughs> nothing happened. Nothing happened. I promise you. I promise. Nothing happened. I, I'm thinking, why is he laughing? <laughs> nothing happened. Nothing happened. But it, it puts up with things, and, 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 and it keeps on loving no matter how many times we fail. That's what love means. It's long-suffering. It, it doesn't give up the moment we have a fight. It doesn't say, I've had enough with this, and goes away. No, lo- love is long-suffering. It compares it with the love that God has for us. He waits. We spit on him, he waits. We walk away from him, he waits. He, he puts up. He puts up, I'll never forget the story that Pastor shared. He said there was this old man and, 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 and he, was, he was homeless in a particular, he didn't have, all the, all the hotels were closed in this particular village. And there was this man, his ministry was to, to just get people in his house and he makes them sleep over his house. That's his ministry, his grace that God gave him and he feeds them and he sends them along the way without them paying. But he has one condition, if you sleep in my house, the only condition I have is that you hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. This old man, he meets him on the street, he says, he hears his story, he says, come, you can stay in my house. He stays with him, and then he told him the condition. It's free, the meal is warm, my wife has cooked it, you can sleep here, and you can go about your day the next day, but you have to hear the gospel. And this old man said, never, I am an atheist, I will never hear the gospel. The man got angry, he got offended. He said, how dare you? I'm, st- I'm feeding you. I'm letting you stay in my house. And you won't even give me your ear to hear the gospel. And he said, leave my house now. And, and, and this is a true story, by the way. And that old man grabbed his suitcase and he began to walk out of the door. And he said, that man said, God spoke to me clearly like he has never spoke to me. And he said, I have put up with this man, with this older man for all his life. And you cannot even put up with him for one day. He said, just one night, he said, he denied me, he spat on me, he told others that I don't exist, and I kept on pursuing him, and you couldn't even put up with him for one night. That, I think, shows the love of God compared to the patience that we have with one another. But he said, I repented, I ran back, I grabbed the man, I apologized, and I let him stay the night. But love is patient. Love is kind. There was nothing kind about the way Amnon treated her. Lust is violent. Lust is violent. Kindness treats people with a compassion and with respect. Love is not jealous. In other words, not envious of the success of other people. Even friends that we have, if people in your life, when you get promotion, are not clapping, they're not your friends. If people in your life, when you're succeeding, they, they're making fun, they're not your friends. They, 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 they have jealousy within their heart and it manifests at the point where it needs to manifest. I am telling you, be careful of those that are in your life. It says love is not boastful. Loving people are not always talking about themselves and their needs and their wants. If you're in a relationship and the guy or the girl is only talking about what they are like, who they are, I remember see, seeing this dating show and the whole show was the guy talking. The girl was so irritated. He was talking about his looks. He was talking about his background, his career, and he didn't give her one space for her to talk. She got up and she walked out of there so fast. I'm like, you go, girl, because... <laughs> relationships like that are toxic I mean if you're always just boasting about yourself look at me I'm this I'm that I'm that I mean love is not boastful it is not proud it's not arrogant or humble love is not rude treating people indecently love is not rude it treats people with compassion love does not demand its own way love is not self-seeking this is at the heart of the gospel if you understand this young adult this will set you free 
if you only care about your needs, about your wants, about your comfort, you have not understood the gospel. Because the very essence of the gospel is that love is selfless. It is not a me and I orientated life. It is an other orientated life. The Bible says that we need to have the same attitude that Christ had. And his attitude, he considered others better than himself. Amnon only cared about what he wanted in that particular moment. She begged him, don't do this. She begged him, you you are doing the most wicked thing. But he didn't care about that. The only thing that Amnon cared was about meeting the sexual gratified need and lust that he wanted to have. When she cried out, don't do this to me, he did not care at all about her response. All he wanted was his need to be met. Love is not irritable. Love doesn't get easily annoyed. You know, some, some people, they just easily get annoyed at every little thing that you have. I mean, if you have a sibling, that's usually the case, isn't it? You get easily irritated and annoyed about everything. But, but this is talking about this constant uh, position where we are not, we are just quickly, uh, quickly just annoyed and we don't really see, uh, that's the position, let me just put it this way, that's the position that we're always like with that person. If you're in a relationship, you're dating someone and you're always irritated and annoyed at that person, ask yourself, if you're dating, you have hope, (laughs) you have time. I'm telling you, that's why I'm, I'm spending time on this series. You have hope. This is the rest of your life. If you cannot live peacefully, if the person is not helping you when you're dating, what makes you think marriage will change that? So if you are struggling in this particular, address it. I'm not saying, say, Yo-Yo told me, leave you alone. I'm not saying that. But say, address it. I mean, why do you always get angry at me every time I speak? You know, tell him, girls. Why do you get annoyed at me? Why do you get annoyed? Every time I say everything, you just say, shut up, and you just get annoyed. Why is that? Do you really love me? I really confront things like this while you're dating that person. Listen to this. Love keeps no record of wrongs. True love doesn't hold past things against someone but forgives. You know, my wife and I, we've had many fights in our marriage, especially the first year. Many fights. (laughs) Some of them went longer than you should have, like sleeping on the couch and all that stuff. You know, (laughs) just out of pride. Seriously, out of the pride that I had. But, but imagine every time we have a new fighting thing, I raise. Remember what you did two years ago? <laughs> imagine how miserable our marriage would be. But do you know what God does? When we do wrong, we go to him. He just wipes our slate clean. And you say, God, I'm sorry. That he said, what, what did you do yesterday? I've, I've, I've wiped it clean. That's the love of God. He's saying, love others. Don't punish people for your love. Don't make them pay for your love. Do you know we charge people what we freely received? Christians are the most guiltiest people in that. We receive things freely from God, but we charge people. We make people pay for our love. We make people pay for our forgiveness. Let it go. Live a light life. Don't live a heavy baggage life. I'm going to quickly race through the others. Love rejoices with the truth. If, if Jonadab really loved him, I'm going to come with friendships in another thing. If Jonadab really loved his cousin, he would have told him the truth. Man, what you're doing is so messed. I mean, those desires are not normal and you need help. Let me take you to the priest. <laughs> Let, get your hand laid on. Get some counseling. You know, that's, that's what he needed then. But he had an enabler and, and not someone that confronted the toxic emotions that he had. And then he says... Love never gives up. If you really love someone, especially girls, let me help you. If a guy really loves you, he will not give up. If you say, I'm not going to call you ever again and you hang up on him, he's not going to say, fine, I'm never going to call you. He will continue to call you. He will run after the thing that he loves. Love never loses faith. It's always hopeful. It endures through every circumstance. The Bible says, as I finish up, that what happened was, after this particular incident, Amnon gets the thing that he wanted and then we see how it was not love. Because the moment he raped her and had intercourse with her, the Bible says that he hated her more than he loved her. But I would say he hated her 
more than he lusted for her because he never loved her. That's what lust does. Lust is all about getting the desires that we have. It's never about caring for that person. It's never about the things that the Bible disca- describes love as. And the tragedy in this story is that even afterwards that this happened, she offered to make this right. She said, it's, it's done. You've done it now. But now at least don't do this wicked thing by sending me away. And, and, and he did it. He did not care anything about her. And, 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 and to show you that he was madly, deeply in love, he was head over heels. No, he wasn't. He was just lusting. He had a faulty signal that should have been addressed. Dangerous. When we have faulty signals in our life, I saw this airplane, airplane documentary, uh, airplane crash investigation, and, and what brought a plane down and killed many people, not the recent one in Ethiopia, many, it's a, it's a, it's a long time one. What brought it down was a faulty uh, meter that was reading not the accurate thing that was happening in the engine that brought the plane down when we have faulty signals in our life when we think we love someone when we really lust after them girls protect yourself from from guys that are there and they just are pushing you to do things that you know god forbids be careful and the bible says this the saddest part in this story is what happens next she goes to her brother absalom her fool her they were from the same mom and dad she goes to him and he sees her because she's torn her robe. That was the pride of, of the virgin daughters then. They, they knew that they, you know, this is, um, that shows others that I'm available for marriage, I'm a virgin. But she knew that that has been violated from her. The reason why she said, don't send me away, she's saying, at least confess to what you have done. Because there were only them two in the room and culturally the man's testimony is more than the woman's. So by him sending her away, he, boasts, he basically is saying, I've, you don't have a chance of getting married again. Because he's saying to her, you're, you're, you're the one that put this upon me. So in her shame, she ripped her robe and she walked to her brother's house. And when she was in her brother's house, can I get Milika to come and play if she's here? She was in her brother's house. And then Absalom looks at her and he said, it was Amnon, wasn't it? Straight away knew. He knew that something had happened with his brother. And do you know what he said? Now, I want every ear, I don't care what appointment you have, I have to go to Dandenong soon. But but I want you to hear me this, because God, I believe, is going to bring healing to hearts in this place. And he said to her, just leave it. Don't say anything. Stay in my house. The Bible says she was a desolate woman. In other words, she just kept herself away from everyone. And, and he said, just stay with me. It's okay. Just let her go. Absalom gave her the, he, he, he made it look like it's going to be all right. Just leave it alone. But what, what she didn't know is that inside of Absalom was a heart that wanted to revenge after the hurt of his own sister. And he was plotting murder all the way through. And the Bible says for two years, nothing happened. And at the end of two years, Absalom knew that in order for David, David heard about it. And one of the mistakes that David did, he never confronted it. He left it. David left it. Perhaps David said, who am I to tell this person when I myself failed in a massive way? I don't know why David didn't confront it, but if David had confronted it, it would have brought healing in the brokenness, but David kept silent when he should have been talking and no one talked to Tamar. What makes me sad that in this story, I don't know what happened to this girl Tamar. The Bible doesn't give us that. I don't know what happened afterwards, but for two years, she was in the house of a brother, a desolate woman. Lost contact with everyone because of an evil that happened not by God, but by an evil man. That evil man, the desires that he was battling with, it was a real desire. It was something that we all are capable of, but he should have got help. But he had around him people that didn't want to help him, but wanted him to die. And then in the end of two years, Absalom approaches David and he says, Father, I want to hold a banquet and I want you to come with all of the family. And, and, and David, I don't know why, but he said, I don't, want to, I don't want to do that. I'm not going to come. But he said, all right, can, can you bring my brother uh, Amnon? Can you let him come? David perhaps thought, maybe after this long, this is an opportunity for my children to get together 
and bring healing and he allowed him. What he didn't know is that revenge was building on the inside of Absalom. And he told his servant, get him drunk. That's what the Bible says, be careful of that. He said, get him drunk because he's not going to know what he's doing. And then he said, kill him. The servant obeys. The advice of a friend brought murder and death. And what we normally see is that in moments like this where there is pain, where there is abuse, and the natural inclination of the heart is, I need to revenge. I need to make that person pay. And a lot of the times, what we don't understand is that people that have abused, they've moved on with their life, they've moved forward, but we're suffering in silence because we're, we just keep silent we don't talk about it a desolate man and a woman and and we keep quiet about what we should be getting help about but i came here to announce don't take revenge don't take the matter in your own hands the bible says the vengeance is mine says the lord allow the lord to bring a miraculous restoration and healing in your situation a good example of this is a story of joyce meyer if you know a little bit about Joyce Meyer, you know she grew up in the hands of her father. The man that she should have trusted more than any other man in her life. And for years, until she was a teenager from a small age, he sexually abused her and he abused her and he molested her and he molested her and he went on and on and on and on and on and on and on. And she talks about how she became a bitter woman. A woman that was so angry in life until she met a man named Jesus. And this man named Jesus began a healing process in her heart that through time eventually got her to forgive her dad. To forgive a great evil that no one can get over but God helps them. And I love Genesis chapter 50 verse 20 because it sums up the point of my message. This is what Joseph said. He said, you, looking at the, his brothers in the eyes, he said, you intended this. Notice he didn't say God. God did this to me. He said, no, you through your will intended to harm me, but God intended it for the good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Let me explain that a little bit and I'll finish. What, what Joseph is saying here is the free will that God gave you, you abused that and you tried to kill me. But what you planned for my murder, God was actually turning it around for saving people's lives. I want to talk to the person that has been through sexual abuse, in their life, I want to speak to your heart today that what that person did with the intention to kill you, to destroy you, to harm you, you might be watching on the screen, whatever that person did to destroy you, to kill you, to harm you, if you would allow God, I promise you, God will take that mess and he will take and he'll, cha and he'll change it into a message and what that person meant to destroy you with, you will know, he will have no idea and she will have no idea that you will stand on their head and that you will say not today because what you what you intended to kill me and destroy me with God will turn it for my good that's the goodness of God he he works through evil it's the sovereignty of God he works through good they're thinking by putting the spear on the side of Jesus that they're killing him but Peter stood days later and he said, you thought you were killing him, but you didn't know that God was using it to accomplish his purpose. With every head bowed down and every eye closed, I know what God is doing in this place. I want to speak to a couple of people in this room. Next week, you do not want to miss out because I'm going to be talking about if you're in this room, what if you've messed up? 
What if in the area of sexual desires and sexual immorality, you're like, yo, yo, I've blown it, man. I messed up. You don't want to miss next week. There's a message from the beginning of this series that, that has been burning on the inside. And I know that God is going to heal so many lives. But today I want to speak to that person. The first person that I want to speak to is you might be battling with desires. With your sexual, sexual desires that are lustful. Man, it might be homosexual desires. Might be pedophilia desires, but you've never said anything, a word to anyone. But you're battling with your sexuality. Before Jonadab comes along your life, I want to encourage you, my friend, go and seek help to someone that can help you. Go to a trusted person. We're living in an era and a time where there are many Christian counselors. But one thing that you cannot afford is allow that desire to consume you. Allow that desire to lead and guide your life. The second person that I want to pray for is your, your Tamar. You've been through a few things in your life that you've never shared with anyone. You might be a male in this room, you might be a female. This doesn't discriminate anyone. I've seen personal stories I've heard of how this destroys lives. But one thing that I want to show you is that you don't have to get stuck in what had happened to you. I promise you that God can heal you. And whatever people intended, God can turn it around for your deliverance. And, and this is the goodness of God. Not only will He set you free, but He will use your story to set others free. I'm not going to ask anyone to lift hands, but you know who you are. And I want you to join with me in this prayer. Every one of us. Say, Lord Jesus. Come on, I want everyone saying, say, Lord Jesus. Today, I come to you just as I am. With my weakness, my desires, with my pain, my hurts and my past help me to let you in my heart to heal wounds brokenness to heal desires that are eating me up I don't want to live like this but I want to be set free. I want you to use me as an instrument to help those that have suffered. Comfort me in my troubles so that I can comfort others in their troubles. In Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, I seal whatever you've done today. In Jesus' mighty name, bring healing in every heart I speak to Amnon and I speak to the Tamar in this room. I speak to the abused and I speak to the abuser, Lord. I speak that in the name of Jesus, your divine healing will come. will bring restoration. will bring healing. I thank you for what you've done today. For whoever is watching, Lord, I pray that you help us to be set free in our sexuality. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Awesome. God bless you. I'm going to just run off quickly, so I'll chat with you next time I see you. Thanks, guys.